Okay. Well, I mean, I was going to start, uh, if you yeah. can just introduce yourselves maybe quickly, starting with you. Yeah, I'm Paul Driver. I'm from the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. So we're the department that's responsible for tech policy. So we work with Codec, we to put, put on these road shows. Uh, I'm based in Sheffield, and most of the team is actually based in London. So uh, I have to try and give a good perspective to any questions that come out of the audience. Okay. I'm Kathleen O'Donnell, I'm from Fragman, we're a global immigration firm uh, based in Sheffield and London and across the world, so uh, we are dealing a lot at the minute with um, loads of startups and, and lots of companies about um, helping them exactly what you said, um, get prepared for Brexit and do the EU development scheme, which is, which is a great scheme, so really encouraging everyone to do that. Hi, I'm Brent Davis, I'm the employment law sister at the BRM Sisters, I'm in the new office at Steel City House on West Street, and we're keen to get involved in the new start of businesses. Cool. And Dom, you know. Okay, I was just going to ask quickly by um, just you two, is there anything that you, you can add to what Dom has presented or anything that kind of stood out that maybe you didn't mention that's on your minds? To what extent we couldn't, uh, couldn't listen into it, to what you said, no, no. Paul, to what extent, no, yeah. no I, mean, yeah. I, I think, look, like, what, I mean, it depends on, on the different aspects, there's, there's different questions, mm -hmm. right, so I think that the one thing I would say is if you take something like the, the settled status, the EU settlement scheme, the reality is, like, that scheme is, and, and the folks at Fragment will know just as well as I will, but that scheme is, like, such a substantial step forward in the process of, of doing immigration, like, that it reflects the fact that they recognise this is an unprecedented challenge. So mm -hmm. the whole point is that you can get your settled status through an app. The challenge is that this app doesn't work on iPhone, it only works on Android as a, as a course of, you know, the joys of the home office. But like, but I think, you know, that, that sort of, there is a genuine push and a genuine acknowledgement of the challenge. I think that, like, the reality is, like, some of these, you know, some of the, for example, the uncertainty that comes from the data flows is because the, the status that we would require um, in the longer run with the European Union, what's called an adequacy agreement, which we would get as a third country, Country with the European Union can't actually be approved until we leave the European Union. So it's like this classic chicken and egg problem. And so I, I think there is an understanding. I think like the reality is what we've heard time and again from the startup ecosystem and elsewhere is that like they don't like this potential outcome, right? So it's not going to be good for them either way. But we can just be as honest as we can about where the challenges are and hopefully help people tackle. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I come in on that. So, as, as Tom was saying, there are certain things where we don't know there's an answer to it, but we know there's an issue that's worth looking at. So, as Tom said, the, the, the visa issue, quite a no deal, and you're planning a business trip to Germany or France, then the chances are the visa arrangements will change. Now, we don't know what they are because they will be set by the country yeah. that you're going to. So, if you know, in, in effect, if we come up with no deal, then we become, even though we're just over the English Channel from, 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 from Europe, we make, you know, we become treated exactly the same as India or South Africa or any other country. We, we, we're a, a, uh, but it's outside the EU, so we will have to, as we're trading with the EU or dealing with the EU or traveling to the EU, be treated exactly as, as any other third country. So, you know, as you say, if you're traveling to Germany, then they, they will be changed slightly to the visa requirements. We don't know what they are yet because Germany will set them, but it's just to be aware yeah. if that's coming up and then to check those websites. Mm -hmm. A lot of the countries have already um, put plans in place as, as best they can for a no deal and they've, they've given UK people who are living there um, quite generous grace periods for the most part. Um, so if there's a country that you, you've got particular um, interest in, um, they will have already done some kind of planning and then we can let you know about that. Um, and I think the main thing really in, in the UK, we're encouraging if, if in your startup you've got any Europeans uh, working for you, then um, definitely echo your advice that um, it's such an easy application to make, it really is, and they can get either pre-sellers or seller status depending on how long they've been here. So just encouraging everyone that you have working for you to, to go ahead and, and do it now um, is our advice. And then if they come in after no deal, um, after if there is a no deal, <laughs> Um, then Euro LTR, it, it will be the scheme. And again, we don't know too much about that yet, but again, it looks like it'll be a straightforward online um, application that will allow people to stay for three years. So it, it's good news on the whole um, for um, immigration in terms of the types of application that people can still come, etc. Presumably it's also really important for employers to 
let their, MP, uh, their staff know that they're going to be with them through the process, yeah. be able to hold their hands, support them through it. Th that's not the most important point thing. Them at it. I think that's the thing is like from the, from the perspective, from the family perspective, like the biggest thing is like in many cases your staff are just like quite scared and confused, right? <laughs> like they genuinely don't know what the, like how the process works. They probably, if they're European, have had no experience of an immigration process in the United Kingdom. And we know that the, the Home Office can be oftentimes accidentally and occasionally intentionally harsh. Uh, and so I think like the you know the more that you can support them through that process and encourage them to, to put in the application. The point about the set of status that I didn't mention of course is um, obviously like if, if we left the European Union with a deal, they would still need settled status, right? So like the point being that actually like uh, just encouraging them in general if you have European staff to apply for settled status is gonna be the best vehicle for them to retain the, the right and the ability to work in and live and enjoy their life here in the UK as they do at the moment anyway. Right, do you have any questions? Can we pull at the back? Yeah, here? sure. Um, just on that, um, I'm going to be recruiting two, possibly three new staff into the university and the yeah. South students are a big group, which is great. We've got, we get applicants from uh, India, yeah. Pakistan, from all over the place, who academically qualify, etc. In Europe, it didn't matter. Now it matters, maybe. Um, so, so, so when we recruit um, international people, they we put them through tier two status. Then they are here for three years, and each year they have to pay for each individual that they bring across in the family about two and a half thousand pounds. So it's a very expensive process. But if you're an international uh, academic, it may be worth it in the long time because in the end, at the end of your three years, you can find a settled status. They definitely need to remain, and then that's fine. Will that process then apply to all of the European countries, including Southern Ireland? So I'll, I'll let the frog. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I can go. You start. Um, so yeah. So um, from the first of January, twenty twenty-one. So still quite a long way off. Will be um, a new immigration system will come in, um, and the government are consulting on that at the moment. So uh, up until then, uh, tier two will, will stay the same. So for your international people, non-Europeans, that will process will be as it is now. But from first of January, twenty twenty-one will be a new UK immigration system and that's what the government's looking at now. Yeah, I think I think the broad point to make there is so the immigration white paper which came out last year which was which theoretically is the basis for the future future immigration system uh, it does broadly broadly speaking treat the idea would be they would treat Europeans broadly in line with the way in which non-European member states are treated at the moment what I would say is that, um, that my understanding is that immigration white paper isn't the basis on which the Boris Johnson government wants to continue immigration policy so like this is the challenge is the, the honest answer to your question around what happens you know what happens for those people in the future is we don't have a set immigration policy from the government yet going forward from 2021 as you said so but, like, but I'm recruiting somebody after the 31st of October correct. so the, the question I'm asking the answer is will they have to go through the same tier 2 process or not, I guess. So, so the, the honest answer to that question, if you're, if you're recruiting a European after that time, yes. the honest answer to the question is, they will have to come here, get the temporary leave to remain, and then we don't know what immigration system they will then have to apply into after that. Is it like, that's, that's the, the God's honest truth of the situation at present. And that goes for Southern Ireland as well as France. Southern Ireland are, are fine at the minute, so um, they're treated it, it, exactly. They can come and work and we'll be able to do so um, without any restriction, um, whether it's now or, or after um, January 21, they're, they're protected. It's a different status. So um, if you're recruiting, for example, an, an Indian national um, now that will, or after we Brexit, they'll still come under tier two. And then as you said, we don't know what will happen after January 2021, there'll be a new system. Uh, for them and that the Europeans that have the European temporary leave to remain will then qualify into if they want to stay. I know that's not a satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> but I assure not you, that's neither our fault nor Paul's fault. Yeah, no, European people want to do this. No, and look, and, 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 and not it's a, it's a, it's a common like this is. These are entirely legitimate concerns that we've heard time and again. And I think all we can say is we're trying to feed these back in because we're well aware that the the uncertainty that that kind of structure creates is hugely problematic. Um, but the, but yeah, we're just trying to be as honest as we can, which is we don't have the answer. That question, yeah. I mean, you know, South Security is 100% employment policy. Yeah. You know, you need yeah. Absolutely.
Okay, more questions? Um, Gary? Um, so so I'm, I'm, I'm a small company, so most of this doesn't apply, but we do, I have a big market in Germany selling software licenses. So it's, it's, a, it's an old style, box standard, non, non SaaS, nothing like that. It's a software they use, we, we, they pay a license fee to us, and that's it. So for now, obviously VAT is yep. quite easy. Um, um, but then, um, I mean, and I would even like simple thing like invoicing. Yeah. And um, what do I do? Go to VAT? Do I have to register or not? Yeah. So, so, so in on, on a no deal, what you would have to do is register. So at the moment, you you can do that through the through the EU MOS system. Basically, is how you would currently do that essentially. And what you'd have to do if you go over, I think it's a ten thousand euro of business outside of the UK, you have to register as a third country with the whatever country, probably Germany, makes the most sense for you because you do business there already, with their EU MOS system as a third country participant. Mm. Um, there is a section on taxation VAT in the document, I think it's number three, but I haven't got the document in front of me. Um, but yeah, what you would do is you would register there and that's how you would structure the VAT. Um, but essentially you'll have to register in Germany for your VAT. Okay. So we have to register in one EU state. Correct, yes, yeah, so you would register in one EU member state as a, as a third party, yeah. part of the third country, and then you could yeah. you could use that as well. Okay. Is, it, is this what happens when, if I'm a US company? Yeah. And I see, so, because wait, I have to, I don't know. So basically I'm looking into registering into a country and then, mm -hmm. so do I have like a, a fat? Yeah, they, yeah. Like, I mean, I, 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 I I'm, can't have a GB yeah. number. Yeah, I don't. I, I'll be totally honest. Like, I don't know exactly how it works, but like, but that is the fundamental basis, which is essentially you're just registered in that country as a third country participant in their VAT scheme, as opposed and through the MOS system that you currently benefit from at the moment as an existing participant. Cam, do you have a question? Uh, I've got two. It's okay. Yeah. Um, First one, my 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 quick. Uh, one of our team has got self status. They have pre-settled status. I didn't know if that meant that they were more risk of things changing later on. A second question, which you might have just answered, but this this is probably going to be a stupid question because I just don't understand it. But one of our key accounts, we're a service agency by research and design. One of our accounts is going to move their, their head office into Europe, probably into Dusseldorf. And I wanted to understand that a lot of people talk about tariffs on products and stuff, but if you're providing services into a different country, I wasn't sure how that was like to change it. So the first one was about the service Yeah, so, so I can answer more about the about the services thing. Like the main thing is, like I said, if you're doing over uh, ten thousand euros of business that's vatable in in another country, then you need to make sure you register. And like I said, the details the details are in there. In general, if it's a service that you're offering from the UK and you're you're, you're uh, invoicing in the United Kingdom, so you, if basically if you invoice them in euros, like in in their country, then you have to make sure you're registered appropriately in that country. If you're invoicing them in pounds based on your work here in the UK, then then you're you're fine. You can continue to do that. Like um, I'll let you answer the immigration questions. So the free seller status is really good. Also, so all they've got to be careful of is not to go out of the UK for longer than two years. Yeah. So if they um, don't do that, then they can qualify for a seller status at, at the end of the five year period, which is a great status because that then is, is like permanent residence. And if they wish to, after one year, they can apply for a British citizenship. So um, that's the sort of path that pre-settle status leads to. Yeah, because broadly speaking, the main difference between settle space and pre-settle space is simply how long someone's been here already, right? So the whole point is like, if you know, traditionally the way in which you, it, like, if you were to try to become a British citizen, you have to be here for a certain amount of time before you can apply for that status. And the same, it's the same principle with the settled status theoretically, is that you would get, you get full settled status if you've been here for a long enough period of time, or if you haven't, you're getting the pre-settled status on the basis that once you've been in, in the UK for that amount of time, you could get the full settled status. Sorry, can I clarify that? Yeah. So, uh, you could, um, it, which is, the, the name obviously doesn't, doesn't contrive to what you think. Oh, I yeah. want that sort of thing. 
Is that so? The precept also does have an expiring. Is that is that what you're saying? So you get it for five years, um, and then if you want to apply for settler status at the end, all you've got to make sure of is that you haven't been out of the UK for two years. So if you have a staff member who's applying for that status, um, best to say to them just make sure you're not out of the UK for more than two years, and then at the end of the five-year qualifying period, they can uh, apply for settled status. Which oh, is so, so the pre-settled is five years? Pre-settles if, if they haven't been here for five years, so say they come in um, tomorrow, um, they would qualify for pre-settle and get that status for five years, okay. and then they can apply for a settled status. Whereas, whereas if you then... Whereas if you've been here for five years already... And you've got a settled status... You can get it, yes, straight, straight away, yeah. Is that, is that similar to, like, uh, like indefinite lift or something? So, yes, it is the same. So it's a really good status to have. You can come in and not work for anyone you like. As with pre-settled status as well, you can work for any employer um, up to five year period and then and switch into settled status. It's a really oh, good, good way the, to... The pre-settled status, even though it's time limited, but you can, yeah. you can not... You yeah. know, sponsored or anything like that, not yeah. like tier two, for example. Yes, it's really good. So not it's, like tier two, it's like one old person. tier one, it's just yeah. style. You can work really good. One. You can work for anyone, and then it's leading to, to settled status. Just be careful not to go out for longer than two years. Is, is the only sort of caveat around yeah. it. And you could come back in sort of the day before the two years and it would maintain it for you. So um, that's another way, you know, that you could, as long as you can literally come in um, the day before the two year period is reached, some people might need to go on assignment, etc. They can maintain that status. Okay, Stuart. <clears throat> so hopefully this is simple. I've got two questions. The first one's around the data protection. Um, number one, Four and five. <laughs> um, so the, the data protection applies to something as simple as sign up information. Yeah, if I just the basic, my yeah. email address and, and then anything more complicated than that, basically. Yeah, it's personal data. And so then around subscription fees and things like that, if you're charging that in euros, hopefully you break the 10,000 euro barrier. Yeah. <laughs> you need to still register. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, when you talk about the, the digital thing, that applies to subscriptions and things like that, doesn't it? You know, yeah, so, so when, we're talking, I mean, when we're talking about services, like that's that's when it starts to get, I mean, what, what, what's the example, I mean? It's a, it's a sports. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so like, I mean, ultimately, I guess, I guess, like I said, there's two questions, right? So, so if the question, if what you're doing is you're offering that service in euros in essentially a market in their country, then yeah. you have to be aware of the VAT implications, yeah. and also some of the e-commerce implications, which again you're in the document. And like, I think that uh, broadly speaking, like when it's a fairly simple transaction like that, you know, we're not we're not talking about huge complication, but things like the ability to move data and where that's being kept and how it's being used is something you will have to have a look at. The second bit is um, <clears throat> as a contractor yeah. um, working in Europe. Yeah. Um, I guess the answer is going to be the same, isn't it, at the moment? We don't know what visas we're going to need. Yeah. Is there anything I can do to mitigate that? <laughs> uh, the honest answer is not. No, 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 no. Can you not get me out? If, if, you, if you let me, if you let me, me a good country, um, we've got really good stuff that's it's absolutely yeah. free of charge on our website, et cetera, and um, everything that's in the public domain is there on our Brexit and microsite. So um, if you know the contract, I'll help you and I'll show you what is known at the moment. Um, they'll have like certain grace periods, et cetera, and then what you need to do, if, if you do need to work after the grace period's finished, you live there. Or, I, I think like one general thing to, 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 to point out is like where um, you know contracts is a great example and we know that people often move in and out and they don't necessarily have permanent residence here or, or, or no proof of their country. Yeah, that's where we know that the immigration you know, for the process of the immigration process is going to be more complicated. And that's almost precisely why actually when it comes to people who are here in the UK, um, whether you know when they move back and forth, it makes sense to encourage people to apply for their settled status as quickly as possible because like that's when the slightly more complicated process processes do take slightly longer. But I realise that they're going out in a different place. What about remote working? 
Yeah. So, still, there's a lot of open questions. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. We don't know. So that's the opposite. We can call a company in the UK and have remote workers in the EU. Yeah. Yeah, so look, I mean, I guess, look, I guess it, dep it depends. So the honest answer to that question, like, it depends on what contractual basis they're involved, right? Like, so at the end of the day, right, it's just like if you have a, a European supplier, you're perfectly still entitled to have a, you know, if you, for, for example, if your dev work is is uh, outsourced to, to Poland and you have a company that you pay in Poland that does that dev work, yeah. that's fine. That's just a contractual arrangement, right? Yeah. Like, there's no problem there whatsoever. It, it becomes more complicated, like, it, it, if ultimately, like, the complications come where it's like, what states does that? person have in you know from an immigration point of view. Yeah. But if they're ultimately a person who lives there and you're contracting with them, all you have to be mindful of is exactly how they're being paid and you know where they're being paid from and how you pay them like tax. Okay. Do you see what I mean? Dave. Um, you know, I'd like to say a different perspective or a different angle on it, which I haven't heard much coverage about, which is what are the consequences if we don't do any of this. So Yeah. Because I'm surprised at the lack of uh, attention that insurance companies are taking to this, uh, yeah. liability kind of yeah. that we all would have. Because um, we saw with GDPR, a lot of them just sticking yeah. two fingers up at it and saying, yeah. it's just not worth it, not a hassle day protection act. Yeah. A lot of it, and there's a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding. Um, I'm just wondering, especially from a startup point of view, when budgets are tight, time is precious, all that kind of thing, what, what are the consequences if the company at the moment? Yeah, 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 no. So, so I'm just wondering what's... So, yeah. so, so I guess, like, the, 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 the example that I always give on data protection specifically is... Um, so I did a ton of work on the GDPR back in 2014. I was living in Brussels at the time, working on policy. Um, and, like, in the, the honest answer to your question is we have no clue how re particular regulators will act in this situation because it's completely unprecedented, mm -hmm. right? But the... One of the things that people consistently forget, particularly about data protection, is the fundamentally different um, attitudes to data protection in Europe compared to the UK, where uh, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from a purely like societal perspective, in the United Kingdom, we think about data as a potential resource and encourage businesses to use it effectively in a privacy appropriate way. Like, whereas in, for example, Germany, data privacy is a human right, right? And the reason for that is, is because of the history of the German state and frankly the Stasi, right? And like, and so the, the, just the way in which we would think about, like, you know, the idea of, of the conversation you have, which is like, how flexible will regulators be? The honest answer is in other markets, probably less flexible than in our own. <laughs> like, and so I think there's a, like, we don't know because it's completely unprecedented and we, we're not sure exactly how people will act. But I think it's reasonable to say that um, in the, in the case of GDPR, which was a sort of pan-European challenge, uh, there's probably a bit more flexibility than there will be in our particular case. And that's for two reasons. The first is uh, it was in everyone's interest uh, in the EU28 to make sure that the GDPR worked effectively and they understood that there was going to be a, a teething period as people get more. Well, there continues to be a teething period as people uh, get up to date. And the second reason is, frankly, like, if you're, you know, I always give the example, <coughs> if you're a, a hotel's website based here in the United Kingdom and there's a competitive hotel website based in France uh, and you're both selling hotel rooms at a hotel in Germany, right, and at one point you find yourself in breach of data protection law because you haven't got the appropriate mechanisms in place but your, your French competitor doesn't, it's very strongly in their interest to make sure that the data protection case is brought one way or another. And there'll be fairly strong push from the governments in those areas to make sure that the you know, there is appropriate enforcement of the European data protection law. Like, that's the reality. At that point, it will become a competitive challenge, right? And so I think, like, being super mindful that, in this case, there is a distinction between a pan-European challenge, which everyone's trying to work through, and one where we would find ourselves in a slightly different situation is, is going to be really important. But the core of the answer is we don't know. Laura, did you have a question? You might have answered it kind of already, but, I mean, we hold a lot of uh, data in European servers. Yeah. And I'm just thinking about the fact that in the UK, yeah. they talk about additional security protocols that they might have 
Uh, yeah, so, so it depends on, so, I mean, in terms of, like, I guess, are you holding that data yourselves? Are you holding it, like, on AWS? Like, what's the... Uh, yeah, it would be, be on right? So, so in the case of something like AWS, I mean, there's two things you can do. Either like you can go and literally ask them to move it to servers that will be based in the United Kingdom, which you can do. But I mean, the reality is, when you're operating with something like, say, AWS or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud or whatever, they themselves will have put the appropriate legal mechanisms in place to make sure that you're covered. It's more challenging when either you're operating yourself or there are smaller suppliers involved. Uh, at either end of your supply chain, and so being super aware that even if you prepare appropriately where you're getting your data from to be working on it is also an open question. Um, so be mindful with small suppliers, but in the case of, of you know, some of that AWS, they'll make sure that, that you're covered up. And on that point, so to beyond, uh, on data protection, that's one area, and on some of the questions we've, that have been asked, we've, we've not had an answer because the information is not out there at yeah. the moment. Still, but on data protection, there is a lot more information. That, that the situation is a lot clearer, so there yeah, are correct. mitigating actions that you yeah, can take absolutely. if you know that you know your payroll is handled in, in, in France or, or, or you work with a, a Polish company and, and the information about customers or products transfers each, each way. There is actually now actions that you mitigating actions that yeah. you can actually take firm actions you can, to, to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, if you go on the ICO website, it's, 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 it's called standard contractual clauses is the main one, which is just clauses that you put into a contract, which is really gives the EU uh, reassurance that you know that, that the data when it comes to the, EU, the UK will be actually treated to a level that, that meets European standards. Um, and there is a, a, um, a question you can go there that actually draws up its legal standard contractual clause which you can insert in your contract. So, so that's one area where it's not so great yeah. uh, on data protection. Yeah, the, pro the process for doing that is fairly clear. And, and actually, if you go on the ICO website, their guidance and their sort of tools on that are really, really good. So I would encourage everyone who has questions about that to do, to do that. Just on the same point, just a bit of clarification. So if we're holding data about British subjects in European data centres, is that covered by GDPR, or is that does that just cover data for European subjects? So, so GDPR would still so the data protection law as it's based. So, at the at the moment, the UK has adopted the GDPR as part of the Data Protection Act. Yeah. So, the point would be like that would still be enforced in the United Kingdom regardless. The question you're asking is like when, I, bring, I, when, I bring from the, when you bring that data back, any data moving from the European yeah. Union to the United Kingdom would still be covered. So, it doesn't matter whether there's British British people or not. The point is, it's personal data. It came out of that jurisdiction Actually, I've got a, a corresponding question. Is there a possibility that SaaS software is going to increase in price if it's hosted in Europe? So are companies that are committed to using particular pieces of software going to potentially incur higher bills because, because of the software they're using? Yeah, I mean, the honest answer is we, we don't. Funnily enough, um, AWS in London has about 10% more expensive than it is in Ireland. We have the same issue, we've got servers in Ireland, we've got European clients, and all of that goes into the AWS in Dublin. Right. And the reason why we chose AWS in Dublin was because it was 10% cheaper than London yeah. or UK. So it's not as easy, and we, we tried migrating quite a lot of our services, and funnily enough, they all charge, start charging migration fees. Yeah. AWS will do it for you for free, but the price is a big difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've just got a question around the definition of the data flow. So we're a SaaS company. Yep. We've got our infrastructure based in the EA. Um, yep. So obviously, you said the transfer of data from the UK to uh, EU is, is fine, and that's okay. Yep. If someone accesses our services via the web browser, obviously they can do that globally. If they're accessing that information in, from the UK, but they're accessing it via our services in the well, what, UK. what information is it? It's personal identifiable information, it's HR information. Okay. Does that constitute the data flow from the EU to the UK? Sorry, just explain that again. So, I think he's saying whether it is a web page impression from a server in a different country, is that a yeah. data flow, or what does it have to be like a database of films or something like that? Yeah, so, so I mean, well, so in the case of, I mean, in the case that, uh, like, your SaaS clients would access that information outside of, like, so at the moment, if you have a SaaS client that's in Canada, yeah. right, and they access that, then yeah, you have, you know, um, you would have to have something appropriate in your contract to be able to allow them to, to do that, like, as in which, which presumably you do as a result. Like, I think that, like, the, the, the question would be, it's more like um, the. So, just to explain the, the situation, you, the example you were giving me. Um, so, we have web servers, the data centers, the data stores are based in Europe at the moment. 
Um, and obviously they're yeah. accessible via a well, web client, which is accessible anyway. Sure. Um, if someone in the UK accesses their information that is from Europe, does that constitute the data flow from Europe to the UK? Yeah, so, so the, the point in that situation would be basically yes. And so like the, what the whole point would be that you'd have to make sure in the case of all of your contracts with your custom base yeah. that are based in the United Kingdom, that the clauses were appropriately in place, right? Do you see what I'm saying? Because if like if the data is held in Europe and they're going to access it in the United Kingdom, you'll have to make sure that contractually they're able to do so. Okay, so I'm, I'm a bit confused with me. Contractually, so, so, so at the moment, so you have, I mean, you have a service agreement with the clients, right? Yeah. So then, so legally speaking, like that, so at the moment, you don't have to necessarily write in in that case because there are European clients and you operate within the same data protection framework. That you're that um, there is any questions around the way in which the data moves back and forth, right? That's not a dispute. Yeah, but, like, but at the moment, we don't have because they could access it from literally. Any no, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, like, okay. I, said, I, I think I think the like I'll, I'll be honest, I'll, I'll come back to you on that specific okay. point because I'll have to ask the Okay. Okay. Any more questions, Trevor or Glenn? Maybe have you got anything to add? I, I, I said, speaking as lawyers, I think the biggest headache is this data, this data protection, definitely, because most, most of our clients are dealing with this, we still get to grips with the GDPR. Yeah, obviously. We still get to grips with that now, it's a major headache. And yeah. the thought of, it's just going to be a massive call in now. Yeah. Like, with, um, the, all, the, all the sort of protect, the, the protection has gone from the union. Yeah. And presumably this applies to non-tech companies, yeah. possibly more so than tech companies yeah. that yeah. maybe have built yeah. their infrastructure around it from from scratch. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the point being, like, the, the kind of, you know, the kind of technical questions you're asking now, like, are absolutely right and the really important question to be asking and the challenge is that in most businesses who, who would probably actually operate in a remarkably similar way wouldn't even understand the technical aspects that we're talking about, right? Like, and so that's the really tricky one is, you know, the sort of rethinking the, the ground up operations of how the business works and genuinely having to think about the fact that you're actually our server based here instead of here is not something that most businesses would ever consider remotely. It's just not been a problem. So like the more that, um, and I think that's why it's super contingent on, you know, like both with European customers and also European suppliers, but have, having like an open and honest conversation about where like you see some of these challenges, like over things like data, precisely because, um, you know, it's great that you guys come to these conversations and we can have a discussion and you'll read the guidance either from the UK or, or, you know, from stuff that we put out or whatever. Like, but the point being actually in most cases, like your European suppliers and European customers won't have thought about this in the slightest. Like, and so the more reassurance you can give them, the more transparent you can be with them about like what contingency plans are in place and you know, how you're going to mitigate that risk. Uh, and, and you know how you're going to provide continuity of service, like that's going to be really, really important, both in terms of uh, flagging to them that there will be a potential change. So if you're, for example, getting from data some, some data from someone, they'll make sure that actually, oh, actually, how do we get that data? Like, what does that mean for us? Um, but also because, like, genuinely, in a lot of cases, they'll suddenly realise, oh God, something might happen. And being open and honest about what that change could be beforehand is probably the difference between a continuing effective relationship and not. Yeah, so we should on that sort of point with data the protection. The, the first uh, point on the, on the information commission's office guidance is, is just to actually map your data. So just to go over there, right, what data does our company use? Where is it actually stored? Where does it actually go to? You know, who actually downloads it? Where does it transfer to? I say, a lot of times, uh, companies don't have to think of that before because they'd be worried about the price and you know, it's not really a concern of where it's stored. But now it is going to be potentially an issue with, with no deal. So start mapping it. Yeah, where is my data held? What data is it? You know, where is it transferred to? And then send when it, when it, if it is, trans is it actually held in Europe and it's going to come to the UK because you, you, know, you, you request it once a month or, or whatever or, or once a week? Then that's when sort of contractual clauses do come into play. So, so do that mapping of you know what data do we use, where is it held, where does it go to? Let me just extrapolate a little from your, your question. So, uh, if we put it this way, so we've got customers in the EU, they sign up with our service, we're based in the UK, our data stored in the UK, that's obviously a data flow EU to UK. We don't have any clients in the US, yeah. but I go on holiday, I log in. Yeah. No, I understand. Let me let me so, let me come back to you on that specific point. Okay. I, I, I completely get where you're coming from, and, and that makes yeah, sense. Whole I'll, have to, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be totally honest. We have a data protection expert on staff, and it's not me. <laughs> but so, like, but I think that exact question is, is something. So that's already an issue. Yeah, yeah no, I understand. 
that's just basically how the internet works. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and I've found that there's been, there's been a lot of confusion. I've, I've spoken to the ICO on a couple of occasions, and, and generally they've, they've been helpful, but with some of these questions, they're still asking what is a transfer. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. It's all you know, have different mm -hmm. advice from different that, people. And, and that's what it's going to come down to from the that's the that's the challenge that essentially you guys are asking. Yeah. And, like, and so I'll have like gen, like in the actually I mean I'll, I'll pull up my I'll give one my cards later anyway, but I'll pull up my email. But if you can email the specific examples because like the more that we can feed those in, mm -hmm. like there is genuinely a very, very good data protection team at DCMS and also all the work going on at ICO who can provide specific guidance on those because I think like, a lot of the cases is like these specific like what about this case is the thing that's most helpful in prompting the kind of right kind of guidance as well to be totally honest. Okay. If you CC us into that answer as well, I'll make yeah, sure absolutely. that it goes out. For sure. Everybody else. Laura. This is a different question. Is it does a Horizon 2020 bid that I've seen to be with uh, creating a data center? Yeah. Is it worth even putting effort into the plan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, look, so so funnily enough, the um, the uh, the a science minister, Chris Skidmore, they, they published a whole bunch of new guidance on the Horizon 2020 scheme today, the UK government, and they said, like, we're absolutely committed in the longer run to, to being a part of the scheme. So, uh, Horizon, you can actually be a part of Horizon 2020 as a third country anyway. So, like, so the point being that the most likely outcome of a, uh, like, long term with the European Union is that we are continuing to be part of the Horizon 2020 scheme in some capacity. So, like, and until we, we leave the European Union, so for the time being at least, like we'd still perfectly be entitled to, to bid, so the point would be I would I would say go ahead. And like and in under those circumstances the bid will just be judged if we left with no deal by the European the UK authorities anyway. So the point would be put in the bid, make sure that it's registered on the UK RI portal that they're putting together to for any bids that are going in, and then ultimately they will just make that judgment instead and it will be funded appropriately through the, the UK agencies. Do you happen to know if they can be using the same model that Switzerland had when they Yeah, so I, I honestly don't know the question, answer that question, but I'm happy to follow with you. Okay. okay, anyone else? All right, well, I'll send it out there. Um, that's really useful, interesting. Um, I hope it was useful to everybody and got everybody thinking in the right way where maybe we haven't been before. Um, I'd like to say a big thanks to Dom and Paul for coming up and to Glenn and um, Kathleen for answering questions. So round of applause everybody. Cheers.